Well, welcome everyone to the uh, December, uh, our December meeting. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have it, we're having it right now. And then uh, please be respectful and mute your line during the presentation, just so that there's not a strenuous background noise. And um, anyone that is a first time member or a guest, uh, um, you know, I, I welcome you. We all welcome you uh, from, our, from the club. And uh, tonight we're going to have our imaging showcase. And so um, the what basically this will be uh, the images that several imagers have taken during the year um, so that you can go ahead and see uh, what they what they have. And uh, Chris Cole is going to be uh, leading that uh, and also with other imagers as well. So Chris, um, welcome. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Anne, for that intro. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, uh, Chris Cole, as Anne said. Okay, but my name is I'm the head of the uh, imaging group um, for the club, and we also meet once a month uh, talking about uh, uh, or have a presentation on imaging specifically um, for the uh, Bly Astronomy Club. So, uh, tonight we're going to have um, uh, three of the imagers, or excuse me, five of the imagers, and um, starting with me, Naveen Malek, Jim Perciocante, I think I got that right, sorry Jim, Steve Christensen, and Matt Lachansky. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to show uh, our images, and hopefully uh, everybody has at least three, um, you know, you, that was kind of the limit, and uh, the whole point is to show you uh, what we've done the uh, past year and show you or and talk about the equipment that we use to take each uh, image. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, my presentation. And so here we go. Let's share the screen. All right, everybody got that? Good. Okay. Very good. Yep. We can see it. it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I saw Doug give thumbs up there. Thanks, Doug. Oh. <laughs> So, okay, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to show two, uh, mainly two images here, uh, just to get a historical uh, reference of how I started and whatnot. So, first, we want to start with uh, the Ryan Nebula, very popular uh, um, deep sky object that everybody likes to take pictures of, and just, you know, visually, it's spectacular too. So, anyways, um, my first uh, uh, um, time out imaging the uh, Ryan Nebula. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing so much. I didn't really know how much I really wanted to devote to imaging in general. All I know is, is that when I first stuck, held a camera up to a Dobsonian telescope to show the planet Saturn, um, I was like, oh, this is awesome. What else can we do? And so um, I stepped up and bought some more uh, equipment. And in this case, I did what's called a focal imaging where I just uh, adapted the camera onto the uh, telescope eyepiece and took an image. And in this case, we're talking about uh, the Rhine Nebula. This is what I was able to get. And uh, right down there, you see the uh, camera and the optic. The camera, look at this here. Yeah. The camera is a, uh, uh, a Nikon 995. And then uh, this is uh, this other uh, telescope that you see right here, made by me, is a hybrid between Schmidt Cass Grain and a Newtonian. And appropriately, it's called the uh, Schmidt Newtonian. So I was like, okay, well, here we go. Nice uh, image, uh, at least for, by my standards, never had done it before. Uh, where can we take it next? So uh, I got a DSLR and instead of a focal, I just took the eyepiece out and shoved the DSLR in it and uh, started taking images of Orion again. And this was uh, my best, uh, uh, my best image yet of Orion. So I was very happy with it. And again, it was the same telescope, but this time I stepped it up with a DSLR. So big change from that guy to that. So next, uh, using another DSLR, we had to buy another DSLR that had more megapixels. And also I modified the, uh, um, the cover slip for the sensor on the inside of it. And uh, we put another cover slip on top of it so that it could pick up the uh, gases that are given off by nebulae, in this case, we're talking about the Ryan Nebula. And uh, also uh, uh, bought another telescope in which uh, would, uh, for uh, 
layman's purposes, it pretty much zooms in on other objects. It gives a narrower field of view, but it gives you nice in your face uh, looks at uh, some objects that you would otherwise see in wider field of view. So uh, I took this combination, went to the uh, Ryan Nebula, and I got this. So good step up. And um, this year, so that was uh, uh, the first image I showed you was 2000, uh, uh, early 2008. And the next one was also in 2008. And now this one's 2012. So fast forward to uh, uh, very early 2021. And uh, I used a refractor this time instead of uh, the other two telescopes as refractor. I also bought, but it was a little bit back before I showed you that last stuff. Uh, telescope, uh, this guy, that's an RC uh, 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 telescope right there. But this time I used a, a refractor. I had never used it to take pictures of the Orion Nebula. And I used the exact same camera I used for that guy. And so, and this is what I got. Now, um, I had another motive here to uh, 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 image this. So yeah, it looks pretty similar to what I've already done. Oh, well, what, uh, what was the whole point of this? Well, <laughs> I got another camera. It's a, uh, a devoted, it's completely devoted for astrophotography and uh, you can filter it for whatever wavelength you like. You can do it for uh, a broad spectrum of red, green, or blue, or you can go for more specific wavelengths of light. In this case, I went after the hydrogen alpha wavelength of uh, Orion. So I got something like this. Okay, so you think about it um, in terms of just science codes. Uh, you think about your eyeball, the retina. You have two types of cells on there that interpret uh, the world uh, around you and your vision. So you have color, like we have here with the Ryan Nebula, that uh, is interpreted by the cone cells, whereas your rod cells, which uh, is kind of analogous to this guy right here, uh, show the uh, different contrasting features of what your uh, what your vision is uh, telling your brain that you're seeing. And so you take those two, the color that and you contrast it and you get something like that. So this is probably my latest effort. I'm very happy with it. I was amazed it came out this well. So yeah, I combined uh, the hydrogen alpha that you saw here and the color and yeah, that's what I got. So that's my history uh, through uh, astrophotography for this picture. And the last picture, well, the second picture I'm gonna show you is on my uh, doing the same thing, but imaging the Horsehead Nebula over the years. Now, uh, what you're seeing here um, is the same telescope and the same camera that I had used for a previous attempt at the Orion Nebula. Now I went after a section of the uh, uh, area where the Horsehead is. And in this particular case, you have right here, this isn't really the Horsehead Nebula, this is the Flame Nebula. And again, I was just wandering around aimlessly, just trying to figure, uh, see what I could do with this. I was having a lot of fun. I don't know if you can see it up here or if you can see my mouse pointer, but uh, right about here is uh, uh, you see a little bit of a red smudge uh, showing up. Well, that is the emission nebula of, uh, of uh, the horse head. So anyway, so using that camera, using that telescope, um, I was starting to um, zoom up or come into this area where the Horsehead Nebula is, and so I caught part of it, the Flame Nebula. Okay, next, uh, went back to that other um, combination that you saw earlier with the um, Orion Nebula. I used the uh, refractor I have there, and then I used the modified VSLR that, uh, uh, again, had the uh, cover slip modified so that it could pick up more wavelengths of uh, particular interest in astrophotography. And I got this guy. So big improvement and got the flame there. And then also, well, I got the uh, uh, horse head nebula right there. So next, um, I did the exact same thing uh, that you saw earlier with your Orion nebula. I took uh, my black and white uh, CMOS uh, astrophotography dedicated camera. And again, I filtered out all wavelengths except for hydrogen alpha, okay? So after that, this is what I get. And same concept uh, uh, holds true with uh, what I'm about to show you where I use the color from this. This is back in uh, 2012 or 2014. I can't see the toolbars block, uh, blocking that, but anyway. So I did this earlier and uh, then this year I did this. So again, use the color, combine it with this to contrast it. And I got this. So very spectacular. So I'm really happy how uh, far I've come. And uh, 
Uh, basically, that's all I have. Um, I'll show you one more image that uh, is a work in progress. And it's a white field uh, view. I don't like how this came out, so I'm probably going to have to go back and reprocess it or actually just image the whole area again. So I did uh, collected both of uh, the areas here in one white field image where we have all this hydrogen alpha uh, uh, gas surrounding the Orion Nebula right here and the Horsehead Nebula right here. So. So thanks for looking. Uh, that's all I have. Um, so I wrote out the list here of the other imagers that are going to uh, present. Um, Naveen, uh, you're up. Uh, so Naveen, uh, he started with, the, when did you start with us, Naveen? I joined the club early this year. Okay, early this, yeah, early this year. Okay, so yeah. uh, he's progressed uh, uh, significantly compared to uh, uh, <laughs> what I have. He saw what took me uh, well over uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, uh, well, Naveen's pretty much been able to compress it all down into one. So take it away, Naveen. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, I didn't think to put together like a montage of progress over time, but let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. Um, so I, I started off this spring actually on, a, I built a barn door tracker um, later got this mount here and telescope and I've upgraded equipment a, a, a bit. So what I'm gonna to show today is kind of what I'm running with now. Uh, the, the mount is uh, an EQ6R Pro. Uh, I've got a, a doublet for my a refractor telescope, uh, William Optic Senior Star 73, it's got F5.9. So not super fast, but it, it's been working pretty well. But a field flattener and it's not a reducer. Uh, so this is a 430 millimeter focal length. Uh, uh, it's a monochrome full astrophotography camera at ASI 2600mm Pro. Uh, so I have the filter wheel with uh, seven filters, you know, narrow band, oh, they're ultra narrow band, uh, Bader or Batter, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, uh, filters with the broadband and uh, 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 UV IR cut for luminance. I use an off-axis guider because I was having problems with my um, uh, focuser shifting around. Actually, like two days ago, I figured out what I was doing wrong. So uh, I think I, I've solved some of my my tilt, some of the tilting problems. Um, I've got a little mini PC sitting in front of my scope, which is great because I could just plop this thing down I, on the mount, hook a couple wires up, and walk away. I mean. Trivial, trivial, trivializing a little bit. I still have to do a little bit of setup, but uh, it's been, been pretty good. Um, let's see, that's about the gear. Uh, this, i uh, got a couple of moon pictures. The first one here is a 8% uh, waxing crescent. I, I decided to just on a lark pointed at this in the morning. I, I everything had shut down. I woke up because I, I I uh, image while I sleep, it was like seven in the morning. This was rising uh, in the, the early morning sunlight. And I decided to go with narrow band filters. So like, why not? Uh, so this is actually in uh, uh, luminance, uh, sulfur two, hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. Um, I, act, I got some broadband data for this as well, but I actually like the way this Pop the, the craters popped a little bit better. The color balance was a little bit better. Um, so that one was a fun, uh, fun project. Like I just tried something random and got a pretty picture. Uh, this is, I, I wasn't able to get out on the full moon. This is 99% a um, couple of months ago. I can't remember. Same camera. This is the broadband filters uh, I hadn't tried doing the narrow band at this point. And I, I thought it turned out pretty good. Uh, I've, uh, I'd also taken a picture of the supermoon back in April and uh, processed the mess out of it. I, I've learned a lot about what not to do. And I think every time I do something new, it's like, okay, that was wrong. <laughs> um, the comets lately have been also a, a fun thing to try out. I'm hoping to get some more time on that. Uh, time on a comment this weekend, but we'll see. Now, 
when I first started out, it was looking through a Dobsonian, eight inch Dobsonian, um, and it was pointing at things like Jupiter, Saturn, uh, it was at the time of the conjunction, December last year. And of course the Orion Nebula. Uh, I managed to get some pictures. Um, what Chris showed in his presentation, the first picture was pretty similar to what I was seeing in my first pictures. Uh, with this new setup, I, I took some uh, broadband color, so color data for this and then layered in uh, hydrogen alpha for the dust in the background. So this has an interesting look for me. I, I, I really like how this turned out. Um, it's really hard to shoot for me. I have to shoot between the roofs, my, my roof and a neighbor's roof. I get a couple hours, uh, assuming that everything goes well with clouds and uh, weather, but i um, pretty pleased with how this turned out. So this was four and a half hours total time. And then played around with a couple of pictures I'll show on that are just narrow band images. So this one is the California Nebula NGC 1499. Uh, sat on this one for a good while. This is a total of 19 hours uh, of data. Um, I use my kids as a kind of a guinea pig when, I, when I'm processing something, like my older kid. Uh, his reactions can make me want to punch him sometimes. But um, this one he, he liked. He's like, oh, it looks like a rainbow. Like, yes, I nailed it. <laughs> so, and then I think the last one I had in my, oh, I have two more. Okay. Uh, Rosette Nebula. So about 15 hours total in narrow band for this guy. Um, this one, when I first started out I, I, on my barn door tracker, uh, I, it took me, I think about one hour to even find it in the, the DSLR camera I initially was using. Um, and I certainly didn't get anything close to this. Um, though it was a, you know, cool to get it imaged with a stock, uh, camera. It was really fun to move back to this target. Uh, in the last couple months and, and collect some data. This is uh, about 15 hours, pretty typical palettes. And then this one, you know, Chris was showing the Horsehead Nebula, Flame Nebula. Uh, I took this uh, in a two panel mosaic and decided to do an interesting palette. Like I've never seen somebody go with these colors before. It's got a little bit of a greenish tinge in the dust. Uh, but because I think of the uniqueness of the, the coloring, uh, I, I kind of just stuck with it and I've been pretty happy. Uh, this one particularly took a lot of time. This, I sat on this for the two panels, at, uh, 33 hours total. The most I can get in one night on this target is three hours if everything goes well, uh, which means I never get three hours. Uh, so this was over 16 different nights of imaging, uh, which is phenomenal for me coming into this hobby and like being able to do this. It's, it's been really, really fun and really rewarding. And All right, Naveen, uh, what, do you, what do you plan on buying next? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I am looking at telescopes. <laughs> I don't think I've ever stopped, but... Well, I, I have to say that uh, for those who are not uh, completely familiar with the optics that we use in the imaging, uh, the uh, most preferred choice of optics that you would go with are with refractors. And uh, the more glass elements you have, the better. The uh, uh, most typical uh, good astrophotography images you would see use uh, three glass uh, elements. It's called an APA refractor. And But Naveen, my God, he did this with a doublet, which is... Pretty unheard of, to, or not unheard of, but pretty obscene to see these uh, kinds of results with a uh, doublet. So nice work. Thank you. Okay, is that it, Nadine? That is all I had. Okay, uh, next up on my list here, I have uh, a gentleman, and I uh, will do my best here <laughs> once again. <clears throat> Excuse me, Jim Perchin Conte. 
You're doing really good, Chris. And that's, that's it. Perch content. You got it. Perch content. Okay. I'm going to write this down photogenetically. <laughs> Take it away. All right. So uh, I'm a DSLR imager. Um, it's been really fun watching Naveen progress uh, in the uh, just in over a year's time. Uh, meanwhile, uh, over three years, I kind of got stuck at Chris Cole's stage. I guess that's three or four of using a DSL, DSLR. Uh, and then uh, a Star Tracker, I use a Ioptron Sky Guider Pro uh, for most of my wide angle stuff. And then uh, when I break out the 350 millimeter uh, refractor, I use a Orion Atlas Pro, which is pretty much the same thing as what uh, Naveen uses, but uh, rebranded as an Orion. Uh, so uh, rather than buy new cameras, I went and took down a bunch of trees. Uh, I guess Naveen can't do that to his neighbor's roof, but at least uh, trees I can move. Um, so I live in Raleigh, but I've got a place up at uh, Smith Mountain Lake where we go on the weekends. And so this is the view out my front yard now that I've taken out the trees. Uh, and so I shot this. This is with a Canon DSLR and a 35 millimeter that I got used. So it's a 35 millimeter F2 uh, and then a Canon full frame DSLR. <clears throat> and I shot this early in the summer. It's really sort of a kind of a scouting project for me trying to figure out what targets I wanted to go for for this year. And the first thing I really wanted to focus on was the Antares over here on the right. I've always been kind of interested in that area and it's something I hadn't imaged yet. And so this is uh, with a 135 millimeter. Um, and again, same camera, uh, and you can see just what a dense star field uh, is around Antares. Antares is the bright orange one over here with a nice reflection nebula that's all kind of yellowish. Then you got a lot of other nice sort of bluish and white uh, reflection nebula in there. Uh, a couple uh, globular clusters, I think there's actually three of them you see. Uh, M4 is a big one in the upper right here. And then you've got uh, NGC something or other. And M80 is a little one over in the upper left. Uh, the uh, DSLR I have is unmodified. And so uh, my camera has a hard time seeing all the beautiful uh, hydrogen alpha. And so it comes up as sort of a faint red. So someday when I get myself a dedicated astronomy camera, I'll be able to see a whole new wavelength uh, and add a whole new color to my pictures. Uh, but uh, I, I like this area with the dark nebula and the reflection nebula and the emission nebula and the globular clusters. So I went in a little bit closer with the 350 millimeter. So the same camera, but now with a 350 millimeter APO refractor. Um, and so now you kind of see everything a little bit closer. Um, I uh, made the colors a little bit more subtle on this one, um, but you can see big old M4 over here, this cluster and uh, and that NGC, I think it's 6144 actually. Uh, and then some other reflection nebula. So one of the things I like to do is uh, play around in the Sky Safari app and see just what it is or where I'm looking. Uh, and so uh, Sky Safari lets you look at an object where it is in the Milky Way, around the Milky Way, or far away from the Milky Way. And so here you see the sun over here in the Orion Spur, and then right next to it is Antares. And so when you're looking at Antares, you're looking at another star right next to us in the Milky Way uh, with all that uh, clouds uh, reflecting all the light around it. Um, and you also saw M4 in there. And so that's a couple of bars over uh, in the Milky Way. And so then you have M4, but you can kind of see how that's all right in line. You went Antares, now M4. And then M80 was in there as well. So they're all in a line. You're looking sort of just over the galactic plane at all these objects. You can kind of see on the bottom there. So I just like being able to see like, where is it that I'm shooting and kind of put it all in 3D space. Um, another area that I looked at with the 350 millimeter uh, in the toward, more towards the core of the galaxy was the Lagoon Nebula here and uh, the Trifid Nebula next to it. Uh, I had to boost up the red to kind of bring out those uh, emission nebula, and you can see a couple clusters in there as well. And then, as long as I've got my camera out and I'm snapping a lot of pictures, I can stop the star tracker, star tracker, and just keep it one place and take a bunch of frames, put them all together, and I've got myself a time lapse. So I shot this back in June, and then I kind of forgot about it for a while. And finally, sometime I think in September, October, I compiled it into a movie.
last one I've got here. Uh, at the end of uh, September, we traveled out west, uh, my wife and a couple friends. Uh, we went out to Grand Canyon, and then after Grand Canyon, we went up to Zion National Park. Uh, and uh, one night in Zion, uh, we traveled a little ways into the park, uh, stopped and asked a, a ranger where a good place to shoot the Milky Way was. And they said, where? And she said, well, I usually tell people to go to this one place, but they're doing a search and rescue there, so you can't go there. Luckily, they found the guy. Uh, but then I ran into a German tourist who uh, saw my sky guider and told me right where to go. Uh, so with just a backpack and a tripod, uh, we hiked a little ways off the road uh, and stood on a little bridge that covered a stream. Uh, and we snapped away. And it was pretty late in the year, so uh, you could see the Milky Way right after sunset and uh, it quickly set. So I didn't have a whole long, but the sky was incredibly dark up there. It was probably about a boil too. Um, and so that mountain over there in the lower left is uh, Watchman Mountain, and uh, you get to see a nice bit of the core of the Milky Way and on up. So DSLR is great as long as you have dark skies. And that's what I've got. Okay, very good, Jim. Um, yeah. Uh, very admirable that uh, you're the kind of guy that does some really awesome uh, wide field work these days. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, have you, has it ever crossed your mind to just map out the, uh, a mosaic of the Milky Way? I haven't uh, thought about doing the Milky Way. I did a big area around uh, Markarian uh, chain earlier this year, but that would be kind of fun to just um, take uh, several frames, maybe the 135 or the 200, just kind of get a nice detailed shot of the Milky Way. And so I might give that a try next summer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing to remember, though, uh, Milky Way comes in two parts. So I challenge you <laughs> to, <laughs> to, do, to do the spectacular summer one and the one not so as impressive uh, winter. Um, sure, no. that, that may be a multi-year project to get that all done. But... Uh, you got plenty of time. Okay. <laughs> it does come around every year. OK, uh, next up. Uh, Next up, we have our resident uh, uh, astrophysicist, uh, Steve Christensen. He's been in the club for uh, quite a while. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I kickstarted him a little bit. Uh, can you give me that credit, Steve? Say that again. <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, I gave you a kickstart in the hobby, I hope. But, that, you did. that you did. And, and, and your mount is in Arizona being hypertuned right now. Yeah, yeah, I got a better mount and uh, turned mine over to Steve because uh, you know, I did I didn't want to go to uh, yeah I still wanted to see it be uh, used by somebody because it was still in decent working order. Yeah, so your mount's going to be used for wide field camera stuff. Okay. I, get, I get I get it back. So yeah, All right. Take it away, Steve. All right. Let's see how we got here. Uh, is that working all right? Yeah, we can see it. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, most of these pictures are on my Flickr album, and I'll stick this in the chat at some point, the link that's there. Uh, I'm basically going to talk about things I've done with recent purchases of, of uh, various equipment, and mostly all in narrowband. Uh, and I'll show you what the equipment is. Just, just for fun, I did a, a luminance and hydrogen alpha of, of uh, the Andromeda galaxy and just because I just wanted to see the star forming region. So, so that's what this picture is. It's just it's a combination that I don't usually see, and I wanted to see that. So that's what this image is. All right, first I'll talk about the equipment that I'm uh, using here. All right, uh, I have the ASI 2600mm Pro. A mono camera, which I'm really, really liking a whole lot. It's uh, very high resolution, very low read noise, fantastic camera. I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. Very high resolution. Uh, and then I, with that camera, you need larger filters. And so I got the, the uh, uh, ASI filter wheel, the 36 millimeter filter wheel and put in Zoella RGB filters and chroma three nanometer filters. And I've been moving from seven nanometer to five nanometer to three nanometer filters. And it makes an enormous difference in the contrast you get when you're when you're doing this kind of work. 
So I've been very, very happy with both of these two new things I've got in the last six months or so. It took me at least six months to nine months to get these things because of all the delays, but I finally did get them. Uh, I'm using the uh, ASI 174 mono camera for a guide camera with a Orion 50 millimeter guide scope. And with that and the Atlas mount that I'll show you in a minute, I've been able to get 10, sometimes 20 minute exposures uh, of these things, of, of some of these very dim objects. So I've been happy with that. And I do the alignment with the pole master, which has also been really, really useful to have. I get very good polar alignment with that. Um, for the pictures you're gonna to see tonight, I'm using the Stellarview 70 millimeter F6 triplet uh, with a 0.8 focal reducer. And I replace the stock focuser with a moonlight focuser that I can control uh, with the computer. And I've been very happy with that as well. Uh, it's all you know, very stable and works really great to get excellent focus and, and, and nice images. Uh, then recently I added these two things because I got uh, tired of cables and crazy stuff that was going on. So I got this uh, uh, power box. It does the USB, it does the dew heaters, it does the focus motor, it does all the USB things I might need. And it sits on top of the computer and, or on top of the telescope and it works fantastic. And then I just recently got a, a Falcon rotator because I was getting frustrated with not being able to get all the exact orientation I wanted. And every time I tried to move anything, I would lose focus. So with the rotator now, I can rotate the, the camera and everything and not have to worry about losing the focus. And uh, that's, that's I'm really enjoying that as well. So I've got all these pieces together. Uh, I'm using an Orion Atlas uh, Pro mount. And since I, uh, I don't have a permanent setup, I put it on a wheelie like this and I keep it in the garage and I wheel it up my driveway to the top of the driveway. Uh, and uh, that's been working really well too. Uh, the, the wheelie I've got has larger wheels on it than this one picture does. But it all put it all together and I, I just roll it out, connect up a couple of wires, do the polar alignment, and I'm ready to go in, in five or 10 minutes at least. So it works, works very nicely. And I tend to work all night, so I don't have to really worry about it sitting out uh, where the neighbors could do something or someone else could do something because I have a camera that I can see the whole setup uh, all the time. Uh, for software, I'm using uh, a Sequence Generator Pro to do the capturing, the focusing, the rotation, and the plate solving with the ASTAP plate solving software. PhD for uh, multi-star guiding, cart to co for, for finding things, planetary software, the Pole Master for polar alignment, and then that, that little Pegasus thing controls all the all the USB and everything, all the power and everything, and two heaters, and it, it all works great. Then I process everything on a Mac Pro with a, a lot of RAM because these things, when you put them into Pix and Site, the, the camera produces very large files, and so if you want to process 100 files, you need a fast machine, and this machine is very fast. And I typically use Pix and Sight and Photoshop. Sometimes Astro Pixel Processor, uh, when I want to do LRGB or, or SHO type things. And then lately, Topaz Denoise and Topaz Sharpen have to proven to be very useful for getting rid of noise and doing a little bit of sharpening and that sort of thing. So I've added that in uh, to Photoshop to do those things. Uh, what, as I said, one of the reasons I like the 2600mm is that it has absolutely no amp flow. And this is just this is a 10 minute dark frame, so-called, where there's no light coming into the into the camera. But in, in older cameras, you would see these these uh, amp flows on the side. There would be white and other kind of things coming up off the side that you'd have to process out with flat fields. And with this camera, that just doesn't exist. So you could almost get away without doing darks at all, but I still do. Uh, and so I'm extremely pleased with this particular camera. Uh, for, for these purposes. Uh, okay, the first image I'm going to show is of, of the Orion area, as we've, we've seen a couple of others tonight doing this. And so this is the Horsehead and Flame Nebula, and that's roughly the size of uh, what this camera and, and uh, field flattener and all that and focal reducers show for this particular telescope. So that's the area I'm going to typically get. Uh, Okay, so this is a, a, 
uh, one exposure of the horse head and flame area to get some of the hydrogen alpha structure. And the nice thing is, is that the, as you see down below the horse head there, you're starting to see a lot of, a lot of sort of hilly area there. And so this camera gives, has a lot more uh, gray levels than a lot of other cameras do. So you from black to white, you're gonna get a lot more levels. So you're gonna see a lot more detail with a, with a camera with this resolution. Okay, and, and so I can get up to 10 minute exposures uh, with this particular setup. And if I'm lucky and there's not too much wind and there's not too many trucks driving by and things like that, I can sometimes get 20 minute exposures and for very dim objects, that's really useful. All right, so now I started out doing, when I was just testing, doing 30 minute exposure or, or 30 second exposures. Uh, you know, I did 30, 10 minute exposures for 30 minutes, and then I did 10 minute exposures for three hours. And you can see the, uh, it's good for you. There's, there's the 30 minutes and there's three hours. So that's what the difference it makes. If you keep going, you get more and more and more detail, the more hours you put into it. Okay. And you, you can see the detail popping out below the horse head there. And so I was, I was very happy with that. And I, I'm just sort of testing to see how the system works. And then another night I added the oxygen three filter on to the hydrogen alpha. And then, so I get that structure. And so you get some color. And then another night I did added sulfur two. And it turned out I saw a lot more sulfur two than I expected. So there was a, they really added to the structure and the brightness of of this area, adding all three filters. Uh, and so you see down here, there's a lot of structure uh, going on with, with this, uh, if you add more and more. And then this, this shows that, it just shows the, uh, uh, the evolution of this from hydrogen alpha to adding oxygen to adding sulfur. And the kind of, kind of effects you can get from that. And then I, sub, I sent this out to the to, to the group. Uh, I was playing with my son and I were playing with making 3D of this, and so we we picked out some of the brighter stars to bring them to the front, and then we put some sort of nebula behind the brighter stars, and then we put the background stars or the smaller stars in the back. And so if you're able to to, to cross your eyes and bring these two things in the middle, you'll see that it becomes uh, 3D, and that's this kind of fun to do. The next step we're going to do with that is to actually get the correct distances to these stars, some of these stars, and so that they're all they're a variety of levels that is more accurate to where they really are in the sky. And then so we're going to we're just playing around with doing some some uh, crazy stuff with what what we're uh, imaging. Okay, the actual first image I did with this particular setup was the veil, and this is hydrogen alpha inverted. And I found that, especially in hydrogen alpha light, if you invert these things, you see a lot more structure than you do if it's uh, normal black and white. And so you see all the little tiny details of the tendrils in these in the supernova remnant. And if so it's kind of fun to do to do that rather than just have the normal black or white on black. Uh, but then I then I added uh, uh, 40 minutes of oxygen to that original. Uh, hydrogen alpha, and I got this image, which is a fairly traditional looking veil nebula image of it uh, color wise. I didn't add any sulfur to this one. Um, so that, that's a very fun object to do tests on because, especially for things like focus and that sort of thing, because of these very narrow tendrils, if you want to really get, get something in a lot of detail, this is a good thing to, to practice on. All right, then the last thing I'm going to show is the ghost of Cassiopeia, which I did on Halloween for obvious reasons. Uh, and this is a, a both sulfur and oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen alpha. And the other thing you can play with when you get something like this is to remove the stars. And because sometimes this, uh, if you have a lot of stars, they're very distracting to the nebular structure of things. And so if you take the stars out, you can see a lot more of that sort of almost 3D structure of the clouds of gas that are in this area. And so that's another fun way to play around with these uh, sort of standard images. 
uh, so uh, so it's useful when you have this kind of thing to take the stars out. Sometimes it's useful just in processing to take the stars out, enhance the nebulosity, and then add them back add it back in on top of the stars to bring out the nebulosity relative to the stars. And sometimes you can dim the stars down or take some of them out or make them smaller or do all kinds of things to get the artistic that, that you might want from these things. So uh, that's what I've got, Chris. All right, very good. Uh, yeah, I like your uh, the, the way the pictures you've been posting with the uh, uh, starless back uh, the starless backgrounds. I mean, it's like another artistic look at uh, what the uh, night sky can show us. So yeah, very good work. Uh, so what's uh, what's your next big thing, uh, Steve? Uh, let's see. The next big thing, I'm, I'm probably going to go for for the Orion Nebula because I haven't done that in a long time with, with this new system and, and do it with my, my Stellar View 102 to get a closer view of it and to see how much detail I can bring out with all these filters and with the high resolution. Uh, you know, it's, it's a common target, but it's something that's, you know, worth, worth playing around with. So that'll be my next. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to put the link to these, uh, the album with these images in, the chat now if anybody's interested there there it is okay very good uh let's see so here we go next uh we have matt lachansky so uh no matt lachansky for a while and as far as imaging goes uh he has taken some of your uh, uh typical uh images up night sky but he has also put a little bit of uh science behind it as far as looking at the composition of some of the stars and whatnot in the night sky as well. So called spectroscopy. And uh, so he's going to give us a look at that as well. So Matt, take it away. All right, thanks, Chris. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I put three images on one slide. Um, and it kind of points out for me, um, you know, I'm, I've been imaging for, you know, quite a while. I'd say close to 10 years now um, of you know, different, I, I don't image every night. I don't go out, but maybe like three, four times a year, really get it set up and going. Usually I need like three or four good nights in a row to bring the scope out. Um, this fall has been amazing. I have to say, um, I did have the scope out for most of the past uh, two or three months. Um, my scope's the one on the left. I have made some changes this year. For one, the guiding that is currently riding on the top, that no longer exists and I do off axis guiding. So it sits right before my filter wheel. Um, that picture was taken about a year and a half ago, um, all without all the cables attached to make it look uh, reasonably good. Um, and then you'll see the three images here. The first one, uh, I was taking all these about the same time. I think Naveen said that he has just a couple hours to image between the trees. And um, I am, I'm just like that. I actually plotted my horizon on Stellarium, and it's pretty ugly. Um, I'm lucky if I get three hours um, on a good night. So M76, um, it was a good attempt at this. Uh, obviously, I got some uh, uh, out of focus subs into my processing and didn't filter them out. So that's what you get. <laughs> um, and then on the bottom, this was just a few minutes. It was 15 minute exposures, HA03. Um, not very much, two hours total exposure. You can start to see some structure. Um, this is also the Pac-Man Nebula. And then NGC 7129. Um, I had a, a fair amount of time on that, a lot of HA, a lot of O3. Um, and you're starting to see some structure in there, some of the faint nebulae coming out. Um, and those little uh, glitches, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but these guys actually exist. in. They're not reflection in the telescope, from what I can tell, because a lot of people's images of this area has these... Uh, these what look like artifacts to me. But I think I found out that I really don't like processing images for prettiness. Um, it's tough for me with, with only getting a couple hours on an object and I like to go do other things and I forget. So, so my real focus, and I'm getting back into it, is spectroscopy. So that is, uh, it's nice because you don't have to take long exposures in all cases. A lot of times it's a short exposure and then you process the data and you do it in a more scientific fashion. So instead of processing for prettiness, you're processing for um, 
for data. And if you if you play your cards right, you can actually have data that gets submitted and used by professional astronomers. Um, this is a gamma cast. So this is that middle star in the W of Cassiopeia, and it's called a shell star. And so that means that it's actually uh, has an accretion disk around it, and it actually glows in the hydrogen alpha region. So that's why you know if you're using in narrowband filters, this would be you know it would really show up because it has a lot of um, hydrogen alpha um, light coming to your telescope. This was the raw exposure, so that's the star. And then my filter wheel has a special little filter in it that instead of um, blocking light, it diffracts the light into its, its rainbow, right? And that's what you're seeing down here. Um, this is probably about, I don't know, maybe uh, 3,000 angstroms up to maybe um, eight or 9,000 here. And we really use the middle area from about 3,500 angstroms to 7,500. Um, I take this, I process it. This is another view of it kind of zoomed in. Um, a lot of challenges with this with uh, spectroscopy because the focus is different. You don't focus on the star, you focus on the spectrum. And if you look closely right here, you can see that little bright pixel and that corresponds to this hydrogen alpha here. Um, there's a number of programs that, that process the data. Um, this one's one costs about $100 called RSpec. And what it does, it just plots pixels. So it says, you say this is essentially wavelength zero. And then you know that this is uh, 6563 for hydrogen alpha, and it plots it plots the whole spectrum intensity of this uh, of these pixels versus the the angstroms, the wavelength. So that's one example. The other example I have here is uh, yeah, Uranus. I have a question. Uh, so, so, like, well, it doesn't matter which one you show here. Uh, so. Uh, Am I correct in saying that uh, wherever these peaks are, are the uh, most uh, uh, are the uh, pixels that are given the most emission? Is that correct? The higher the peaks, the more emission they have. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the higher the number, the brighter that pixel is. Okay, all right. Yeah, so you have the the pixel brightness on the y-axis, mm -hmm. and originally the distance, like what pixel number it is across here, mm -hmm. around the x-axis, is is here, and you convert that into angstroms. Which is your wavelength? Okay, very good. Thanks. Um, there's also processing for instrument response and a few other things. Um, you generate that once and you're done. Um, I didn't want to go into the full processing. It, it's much quicker and easier than Pix Insight. I will say that. <laughs> very good. Yeah, that's why I like it. it it's quick. <laughs> um, so this is Uranus. This is Uranus right here, and here's the spectrum for it. Um, and you know, Uranus doesn't put out its own light. So it's not like imaging a star. Um, you would expect the spectrum to be similar to our sun because it's just reflecting the light from the sun. But Uranus has all those methane bands and that's what you're seeing. Each of these blue lines corresponds to the absorption of light by methane. So as the sunlight hits the planet, it gets uh, kind of a little bit absorbed in the cloud tops before it gets sent back, reflected back to Earth and into my telescope. Um, and so you are seeing essentially proof that there's methane on Uranus. Um, this is what the spectrum looked like. If, if, if you twisted this around and looked at it a little closer, and you can see the gaps in the spectrum here, here, and here, and there's your, your data. So I'm getting more, more and more back into the spectroscopy. It, it's not something I, I can really get into for just a few minutes. It, it's you got to see what's out there, see what transient objects are there to observe um, and kind of connect in with a few people who might be interested in your data. But it's great. Um, and if anyone's interested in spectroscopy, I'm happy to give either a presentation on it or, or uh, go through it with someone one on one. That's all I got. Okay, very good. So I know I've asked you this before about your uh, spectroscopy uh, back when we were meeting in person because you did do a nice uh, presentation on this. Uh, uh, what are the odds? Well, I don't know if it's too late just because of how unpredictable we're seeing uh, comet winter go, but you see where I'm, uh, or how comet winter is uh, going to uh, make itself uh, available over uh, the next few days. But uh, uh, ha have you considered ever doing that, doing spectroscopy on a comet? Yeah, um, I think I have in the past, and I might even have some data that I've shared on that. Um, Leonard is a morning plan, morning comet right now, and I'm not a morning person. 
But um, perhaps when it gets down in the evening, it, it's kind of going to hang low on the horizon. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get it or not. But yeah, um, a lot of people do spectroscopy on the comets. Okay. Um, you can do quasars. I mean, every, I mean, there's a lot of things called wolf ray stars. They're really interesting. It, not all stars are just, you know, uh, sun-like. And there's a, a whole zoo of different types of stars. And the spectra from each one is different. It's very interesting to me. Matt, can you do do exo, anything exoplanet with, with a spectral shift or anything like that? Uh, no. Um, for something like a supernova, I can do Doppler effect and see the, the movement. But I think, remember in spectroscopy, you're spreading your light out over, you know, you know, it's, a, it's a, about 100 to 1,000 fold dimmer than looking at it just as if it were a star. Um, I can get down to about 12th magnitude. Um, I can't imagine there's any anything I can see. I even tried, um, there was a nova recently in Aries. And I think that was 15th magnitude. And, and I could see the nova, but I could not see any spectrum for it. OK, very good. Uh, so uh, well, uh, that's all I have. Uh, I want to thank the other imagers who uh, presented with us. And again, my name is Chris Cole. I am uh, head of the uh, imaging group here at the Raleigh Astronomy Club. Uh, just to let you know, just like uh, the regular club, we do have uh, monthly meetings. and. Uh, just check the calendar because I don't have time to really go into how those are decided. But I will say that all of our meetings are on a Thursday mm -hmm. uh, night. And uh, yeah, so what you're seeing here, the work that uh, we've uh, 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 that we've all presented here is just a sampling of what all of us do, including the other imagers that are not here. And um, come over to the imaging meetings. Uh, uh, you can also uh, learn about how uh, these images are processed. That's something I didn't really want to go into uh, too much detail tonight with everybody, but uh, uh, yeah, there is you know some other aspects of this just besides just going out, shoving a camera into a telescope and taking images. So there's a little more to, well, more to it than that. I said it like that. So uh, anyway, okay. So thank you again. Uh, my fellow amateurs, and uh, and back to you. Okay, well, thank you, Chris.